Well, hey, we're, uh, we're in a new series. We're taking a look at, uh, at the story of God, and we're going to start right at the beginning, and, uh, and I'm going to walk us through, and, and this is going to be a fun series. In fact, coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, Bruce Wells is going to preach for us. Some of you know Bruce. He's been around a while. Some of you don't. Bruce is a professor of Old Testament. So, uh, so whenever I preach a sermon in the Old Testament, I'm always looking with one eye out over to Bruce just to make sure I'm getting a good grade over here, you know. And uh, he's, he, is, um, he is full of knowledge, uh, but also a passionate relationship with Jesus. So I can't wait to have Bruce, and he'll be with us in a couple weeks to help us as we take a look at the Old Testament. And, and we're going to guide through that and then get to the New Testament. And then believe it or not, that will launch us right into Advent, right? This time of, of waiting for Christmas to come. And so I'm excited about the next few weeks. We're going to go to the creation story today. That's what we're going to take a look at. I go back and rehearse this often. We talk about it quite often. I'll often go back and just spend a minute and kind of say, you know, remember the creation story. This is the way we were created. But I always walk through it pretty quickly as part of a larger sermon or part of a larger point. We kind of go back to this story, but, but we don't often just sit here and talk about it. So this morning, I want to encourage you, if you have a Bible with you, if you have a phone app with you, uh, you pull that out. If you're online, I want you to click on the little Bible link and join with us. And we're going to go right to the beginning. This is Genesis chapter 1. And I'm going to walk us through really slowly Genesis 1. And today we're going to read through Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. So there will be a lot of reading, but, uh, but you can hang with me. You got an extra hour of sleep last night. So you're, you're good, you're fine, you're ready to roll okay I, and all our translations may be a little bit different but uh but just follow along with me from these words and, and i want you to hear uh the story i want you to hear what god is doing in this genesis 1 is written uh, if, you, if we were to read this in the hebrew we would see that this is in poetic form not not rhyming poetry but it's designed as a poem that's how it's laid out but it is telling us the story of who god is telling us the story uh, of what our world is about. And it's telling us the story of how we fit in this picture. And so I want you to hear this. Let's read together. Genesis 1 says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said, and God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, and the first day. Okay, I want you to listen for this pattern, right? That's a pattern that's going to repeat in, 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 uh, in all through this first chapter. But I want you to listen to it, because what happens is you get creation, Right? Creation happens, and then you get order. So God's going to create, and then he's going to refine. He creates, he creates day, but he separates light from, he creates light, but then he separates light from darkness. So he's going to create, and then he's going to refine. And then, and then God's going to evaluate. He takes a look at it, and he says, it's good. And then he gives us a boundary. That's the end of the first day. And we're going to get that uh, time and again, right? He creates, he refines, he evaluates, he pronounces good, and then he we move through this boundary of the next day. Okay, we'll keep going. And then God said, this is verse 6. Then God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and he separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. And God called the vault sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. Verse 9. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let the dry ground appear. And, so, and it was so. God called the dry ground land and he, call, and he gathered the waters and he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their various kinds and the trees bearing fruit and seed in according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning in the third day. Okay, so he created land, and then within the land, he starts to refine that. And as he refines it, we get these little categories. He's, 
he's kind of letting us know the details, but also the abundance. There wasn't just a tree. There wasn't just a blade of grass, right? There were trees, and, and the trees come from seeds. And so we get all these little details that, that creation is sort of bursting forth. And that's the image you should be seeing here, right? It's starting to happen, but it's happening in abundance. Creation's actually bursting out, is growing, and, and there are all kinds of creation are happening at the same time. Verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. So now we're refining, we're going back to day one, and we're kind of refining day one now, and, and we're going to get, we're gonna get the, the details of this. To separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. So we're actually even refining time here. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And so it was. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. Like, I like that little statement there. He also made the stars. Like, that's, that's a pretty big day, actually, right? I mean, you think about how many stars we're talking about. We're, we're billions. And it's just one little sentence. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light to the earth, to govern the day and the night, to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. It keeps going. It keeps going. We start to see uh, these incredible themes that are emerging from this. And today, what I want us to do is take a look at the great themes that start right here. They all start right here. And that's why we're taking time to read through this. And I know it's slow, but I want you to read through it because the themes that start here are going to travel all the way through the scripture. And the themes that start right here, not only are going to travel through the scripture, but they're going to travel into our lives. Okay, so I want you to hear them, and I want you to start to listen and, and hear these things picking up. Now, it starts to get good, right? It starts to not just go from just starting, just creation, you know, the stars, to teeming with life. Listen to this uh, next part here. And then this is verse 20. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth, across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed it and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill in the water in the seas and let the birds increase uh, increase on the earth and there was evening and there was morning the fifth day and God said let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds livestock creatures that move along the ground and wild animals each according to its kind and it was so God made the wild animals according to their kinds the livestock according to their kinds and the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds and God saw that it was good and then God said let us make human beings in our own image the, the, the phrasing changes just a little bit you're meant to pause there something special is happening let us make human beings in our image in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath, the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, and the sixth day. God gets to this creation, and the culmination of the creation is humans in the image of God. Male and female, he creates them. And then the, a little slight change in the language. Not just it was good, it was very good. All right, I want us to look at the themes that have come up 
in this passage right here. And I want you to listen for them and, and, and think them through. And we won't have time to go back and reread this, but as we talk about the themes, I want you to kind of go back in your mind and, and, and listen for where that picked up. The first thing that happens, the first major theme is this. God spoke and it was so. God's creating, right? God's this artist and he, he creates and he just speaks it into existence and it begins to happen. What you see, the first major theme is that this world is full of life and it's bursting forth with life. The, 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 the seas are teeming, right? On one day he fills the seas, on another day he fills the land. And he doesn't just do a little bit. It's not just one animal or another animal. He just goes crazy. God just starts filling this world with life. It's a creative world that he has, uh, that he has spoken into existence. You know, I, um, I think about that quite often because I don't like yard work. And uh, I don't know if they, some of you guys, you're yard work people. I got a neighbor, man, his yard is perfect. And uh, it is so awesome. And every time I talk to him about yard work, I just apologize. I just go, sorry, man, I'm I'm sorry, we're just not, we're not yard people, but I don't like yard work, and stuff just keeps growing, right? It just keeps, I add a little bit of water, we get a lot of sunshine, it just keeps growing. In fact, uh, we have got weeds popping up out of everywhere, every little crack, you know, every little crack in our sidewalk, I mean, it's, it's in concrete, and we'll just see this little sprout, you know, coming up in the middle of the concrete, just a little crack there, and, and somehow, somehow life just finds a way, even in that little crack, then I got to go around muttering and pulling out, you know, weeds. My, uh, my brother-in-law, he doesn't like using yard spray, it's toxic chemicals, so he got a little flamethrower, and, and, I, and I, I talked to my wife about this, he has this flamethrower, he actually just burns the weeds off the sidewalk. I was like, that is the coolest thing in the world. And Cammie, whenever she complains about, you know, the yard's a little out of control, I'm like, dude, if you got me a flamethrower, I would be a great yard guy. I mean, I would just, I would be all over that. But it just keeps, the, the life just keeps coming up. I feel a little bit better about it. I, I drop off uh, our youngest at preschool several days a week. And, and when I do, as I'm coming through the line, there's this building. It's sort of a little bit of an outbuilding. And I don't know, maybe they just use it for storage. But somehow, that building has a plant that is inside. The window's shut. I don't even see how light gets in there, but the plant has grown and it's come up the window and now it's coming out of the sides of the window and the plant is reaching outside for sunshine and life. And I see it every day and I think, man, that plant wants to live. Our world is bursting with life. It just keeps you know, every kid, if you give a kid just some supplies, they start creating stuff. Have you ever seen that? Like, you know, you just give them some supplies. It might be a mess to our eyes, but they'll make something. Give them some glue and some glitter, you know, and I mean, things are just going to get, just going to get, wow, every kid's an artist. Why? Because we're the children of an artist. Because we're born to create we're born into this creative and life-filled world. And in the middle of this, in the middle of this garden that God creates, in the middle of this world, he sets a tree. This is in chapter two, and we're not going to get to read through the whole thing this morning, but if you go back and, and look at chapter two, he's going to set a tree. Now, uh, he sets two trees, and, and, and one of those trees, the knowledge of good and evil, that's going to be part of our theme for next week. So we're going to look at that one next week. But there's this, there's this other tree. It's the tree of life. He plants it right in the, right in the middle of the garden. It, it explains how these, these rivers run right through the garden. There, there's good material there. In fact, it, it takes some time in, in chapter 2 to really explain all the raw materials. Because God starts with raw materials. He starts with light, and then he begins to refine it into stars, and, and day and night, and, and, and even into time. But he starts with the raw materials, and in chapter 2, it tells us how they're the, the raw materials, and these rivers run into the garden, and in the middle of that garden, he puts a tree. And we see this tree planted there, and if we were to take it as a theme and walk all the way through Scripture, we could trace trees through Scripture. 
God shows up around a grove of trees. That's a good Old Testament story. We don't have time for this morning, but, but, but then uh, we move to the New Testament. We see that Jesus shows up, and there's a tree in the middle of that story. And if you go all the way forward, you carry it all the way to Re- Revelation, and you were to pick up and uh, read Revelation 22, you're going to see that same tree. That tree is now planted, but it's planted in the middle of the great city. Uh, John the Revelator is giving this description of what the kingdom of God looks like when it's fulfilled, when God comes back and and brings all things to to their full purpose. And and that tree shows back up. It is right in the middle of the river, just like we see in in Genesis chapter 2. That that tree is right there, but at this point... There's actually a city all the way around it. It's like this tree in the middle of the city. Now, some of us, some of us, we look around the city and we're like, man, that's a little grimy. City's not my, you know, I like going out to the hill country. I like being out where it's beautiful. But, but did you know that cities were not actually a negative thing in Scripture? Uh, that's not the way that it's set up. Because God created us to be creators, to build and thrive. Now, I'm not saying that we run our cities all the right way, and that's not the biblical picture of, of this city, but, but it wasn't seen as a city as a bad thing. It wasn't uh, a city didn't give us decay and overcrowding. That's not the biblical picture of a city. The biblical picture of a city is that, that we created, that we built, that we grew. And in the middle of this picture this image in revelation here's this tree and the tree's grown and here's the garden and the garden is in the middle of this incredible city that tree runs all the way through and this theme of creation and being full of life and bringing life that's a theme for uh, all the way through the scripture okay so uh so that's that's theme one and if we were going to trace that through Scripture today, we, 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 would, we would trace and we would say, we would see the flourishing of people. We, we would see that the, the next few stories are going to be about the descendants. They're going to be about a, 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 a group of people called, and, uh, called by Father Abraham, right? And they come from Father Abraham, and they become this group of people. They become a family. They then become nations, and we're going to see them flourish If we were to go to the New Testament, we're going to see the church starting to come together as a family and begin to love each other. We're going to see them grow, and we're going to see them flourish, and we're going to see them bring life. But most importantly, as we get to that New Testament, and we see this theme of of life being brought, we're going to see Christ coming into a very broken world. Now, next week, we'll talk about the brokenness. We're not going to pick up that theme yet, but, but, but Christ comes into this broken world. Why? Because life. Life is one of the core themes of God. If we want to know who God is and, and what God is like, and we start right back in Genesis 1, one of the major, one of the major descriptions of, of God is that he brings life. And so when he shows up in the New Testament, he comes to actually bring new life. Guys, this is incredible because this is, this is kind of who we are as a, as a people of God. We're people of life and of new life. And if you find yourself living in a way that feels like death, you, you should stop for a second. You should go, hey, what's going on? Because that's not what you were created for. You were created to be filled with life theme from scripture okay so that's just one we got four we got four and we're already running out of time all right so i'm gonna keep keep us going because remember we gotta get through the whole bible in just a few weeks so we're, we'll get there okay Here, here's the second thing that you you start to see happening in in, in that just in, right in chapter one not only does he bring light right not only does god speak and light exist but then i told you he refines it he sets apart day and night and then later on he, he just creates the stars But he not only does that, he gives us the sun and the moon, he governs the day and the night, and and we start to see time being put into place. That that was all in that creation uh, story as God creates the earth. You know why? Because not only is God full of life and bring life, but God brings order. Order is a key theme in here. Not only does he just create the animals, but did you see he categorized the animals? They were in their categories. In fact, if we were to get to chapter 2, we would see that the, the animals were given to the humans to name, that Adam was to name the animals, that, that they were categorized and named. 
that they were ordered. He doesn't just plant a bunch of plants. We see God talking about seeds, right? There's all kinds of seeds and trees, and I get lost in that language, my eyes gloss over. But he doesn't just plant plants, because in chapter 2, he tells us it's a garden. Now, some of you have gardens that look like mine. The garden in my yard is, uh, we did a raised bed garden several children back, right? I mean, it was like several children ago. We tell time by children racing in my house, so it, this is like two children ago. We said, let's plant a garden. But it, it, you know, you might not interpret it as a garden. I, if you saw it today, you would say, there's a lot of growth over there in that, you know, in that box that is up. There are things springing up, but it does not really look like a garden. It's just stuff. It's just weeds growing. And when I see it, I think weeds. And I, whenever I come out with a weed whacker, I'm going to go fix the garden, I tell Cam. And I go with a weed whacker to the garden. She says, no, wait. You know, there are plants in there. There are good plants. There's, there's little spices or I don't know what, cumin in there or something like that. Spearmint. I'm not really, you can tell, I'm not much of a green thumb. Anyhow, I'm just going with the weed whacker, man. We're going to bring this thing down. We're going to get it into order. We're not good at gardens, but God He's a gardener. My in-laws, they love to garden, Cammie's family, and they will spend hours and hours and hours bringing order. And as they bring order, it just brings beauty. And they, they, they put the garden in place. Because you know, you don't just plant a rose bush and it'll just grow. You can't do that. I thought that should work. Maybe give it a little bit of water. No, you actually have to go and cut it back. If you cut it back, it'll bloom even more. You have to prune it to bring order to it for it to actually flourish. And as we look at God's world right from the beginning, right from Genesis chapter 1, not only does he create, not only is it in abundance, not only does he bring life, but he brings order. And we live in a world that is ordered. You can see it even around you. Did you know that music, I mean, Artha beautifully plays this music, and to me, I like to just hear it. I don't know uh, a lot about music, right? I just, I just hear it. But if you were to get into music, do you know, there's a, there, you can see the math actually in music. Even music is ordered. As you play a note, that note has overtones of the next note that come together for a chord. They, they, it leads to the next ones. There, there are chords that play, and, and they seem like they just go together because they do. If you were to actually chart them on a wave graph, you could see that they actually flow together. And other chords, they, they're dissonant from each other. And you can see where they're dissonant, that it, that it makes sense that, that our music is actually ordered. You know that we have order in our, pr our principles of things like physics. And because of the principles of physics, we're, we're able to make calculations and predictions. We're actually able to send rockets into space. It's order. It's not order that we even create it. We just see it. We're trying to harness it. We're trying to understand it. But our whole world is ordered. You know, uh, you think about the order. Just incredible order of our world and of the creation you know our uh our hands right you guys know this you hold your hands out that's about approximately the same length as your height now some of you are missized and that's okay you just you got a little extra arms there or whatever uh, you know that's okay but uh but in general right that's the that's the link now when i was a kid it was a joke you would say you know if your face is the size of your hand and people would hold their hand up and they pop them in the face I, I i don't know about that but i did learn something else the other day did you know did you know that our eyes are like actually in the middle of our head from top to bottom did you did you know did you know that Whenever I draw a picture of someone, they look really weird. It's because I always put the eyes up here. But if you were to take a graph of my face and chart it out, now I might be a little misshapen. I might have to go uh, like this down uh, a little bit. But if you were to graph out my face, the eyes are actually in the middle. They're not at the top or the bottom. We're ordered. There's symmetry. There's actually symmetry. Uh, the sides of our face and the middle section, that's actually corresponds with our eyes. There's symmetry even to your face. Symmetry to our bodies. Symmetry to our world. And even as we push mathematics even further and further and we find what seems to be chaos, even chaos has its own, has its own mathematics to it. And every day we're learning new discoveries of mathematics. There's not disorder. There's 
order that we don't even understand yet. Our world is completely ordered. I have a kid, uh, you know, uh, one of my kids, she's a seven-year-old now, but even when she was real little, I, I walked into her room, and, and she had a bag of seashells. I don't know where she had gotten them, you know, just a huge bag, probably some from a grandmother, some from a trip. Mostly, they're little shards of seashells, right? They weren't like big, beautiful seashells, just little pieces. And I walked into her room, and she, I mean, hundreds of them, and she has them lined up, right? And, and she has them categorized by size and then by color. She had a color size sort of chart going on as she had laid them out. Now, not all of your kids are, uh, are like that. I understand that's a little bit unusual. I looked at her and said, what are you doing? You know, do we need to call a counselor? Uh, what, is this, what does this mean? But, but there is something about that in every one of us. Even those of you that, that kind of like action and movement, there's a part of you that needs structure and order. True for each and every one of us. Because wired into us. This is the way that God created us. It's the way that he created the world. There's order right from the beginning. God sets things into order. If we were to trace it through the scripture then, we would see that not only did the, the, the people flourish, but they were divided into groups, uh, even tribes, right? We have these 12 tribes, and whenever you see that number 12, that's a certain order. That number 12 runs all the way through Scripture, and it, it, it's talking about the order that God brings. And within that, there were different roles and divisions of labor, and that happened throughout the people of Israel and all the way through Scripture. We see that things are ordered. In fact, one of the major themes that we're going to talk about when Bruce is with us is that, that, that order was brought by the laws. The law brought order. It helped us to be able to live together in relationship because there was order and things were well, well ordered. You know, as we're in this election time, this election season, some of you watched that first debate. And what I thought was very interesting about that was the response to the debate across the board. I have friends on very far to the left and friends that are very far to the right. And across the board, everyone was frustrated with that first debate. Why? Because they felt like order was missing. Not where you land politically, but there's this, there's this longing underneath of us that we, that we long for order. Now, some of us get a little get carried away with order, right? Some of you, and the, you're, you're a little carried. It's like, okay, relax on the order a little bit. That, that's okay. But there's this underlying longing for it. And when it's completely absent, we find ourselves frustrated. God gives us order all the way through the scripture, establishes laws for living. And then when Jesus shows up, Jesus shows up, there's a scene, he shows up and he goes to a synagogue, and it's when he's getting ready to start his, he's getting ready to really start his ministry, and when he does, he asks for the scroll, and he unrolls it, and he starts reading from the prophet Isaiah. This is considered when he starts his ministry, and he's laying out what he's going to do, his, his sort of ministry plan, this is his, his mission. And as he does, he begins to read it. And he begins to read what we would call a description of the kingdom of God. And when he reads, he's reading about setting things right. He says those, those who are poor will find what they need, right? Those who are hungry will be given food. Those who are blind will be able to see. Those who are lame will be able to walk. Those who are in prison will be set free. He, he's talking about this order, See, there's this great brokenness by the time we get to Jesus. And, and into the great brokenness, Jesus comes to bring order. The kingdom of God is all about order. It's about setting things right, the way God created them to be. When we look back to that garden in this beautiful time, it was kind of setting that right. We need to go back to the garden, but even more so, we want to go forward to God's full, full consummation of this order, this kingdom. Jesus brings order. We see order blind can see, the hungry are fed, the poor are cared for. And your life has purpose and meaning. It's not, just, it's not just living the next day and doing the next thing. You were created with a purpose. That's part of who we are. Okay, number three. We got to do three and four, and I've got like two minutes. Okay, here we go. There's two more themes. The next great theme not only does God set this in place, but he enters into the story. God breaks a major storytelling rule 
It is not, you know, it, this, is, this is how he lives it out. This is not just some, some well-crafted story. This is what happens. This is God's truth. And here's the major thing that's broken. The writer of the story enters the story. You're not supposed to do that. God shows up. He tells us when he creates, he creates male and female in his image image bearer is there. Now, this is something that would be common in the, in the ancient days. They would have known this. When, uh, when they, uh, let, let's say Rome begins to take over and expand, and they expand to Israel, and they're, they're in authority over Israel, but Israel's a far outpost from Rome. They're going to put a statue of the Caesar there. They're going to they're put a statue, and this happened in all those, in the ancient cultures all around Israel. You would put a statue or some some marker that says, "Look, th- this is this is who's in charge." The image bearer, and that, that that image would have power and authority. It would be this reminder of power and authority. But God, when He creates a world, He creates He creates His image as well. But instead of it being a statue of just a reminder, He puts it in us, like, like that we carry this reminder of the power and authority of God. We we carry this reminder of the creative of God. We carry this reminder of the order of God. We carry that in us. We become image bearers. God enters into the story. He creates us in his image. And there's another piece to this too because we see right from this, right from this uh, story that God not only creates us in his image and enters the story, but that God is relational in his very nature. You see, it says God created us. Uh, sorry, sorry, let us create, uh, create humans in our image. It goes to a plural there, right? Let us create. Why? Because God is plural. God exists in relationship. This is uh, what we call the doctrine of the Trinity, but God, God is in relationship even in himself, and then he creates humans, humans in the image of him, and later, if we could read chapter two, we would see that God walks and talks with his creation. He talks with his people in the evening. He builds relationship with them. And in chapter two, we get this detail of the story of God creating humans. You know, everything, God, God creates it, it was good. Creates it, it was good. He gets the man, he creates him, and he says it's not good. One thing in this whole story, the first two chapters, that's not good not good for man to be alone and he creates eve we get this spotlight on the importance of relationship not like relationships like a good thing to add on to our life but oh you know we should have some relationships that'd probably be all right no it's at the core of how we were created it goes right back to the creation story god the relational God, and as reflection of him, we are relational people. Relationships matter, and, and they walk all the way through the scripture. Intimacy, connection, relationship, these become central all the way through scripture. When I, uh, get, when I do a wedding, I, I did one just a couple days ago for a, a couple here in our church, and when I gather for a wedding, they're standing in front of me. I, I get to this point where I'm talking to them about being created. It says, you know, uh, we were created, the two would become one. And as I get to that point, I, I say it in almost every wedding, I stop and I go, I, I, I tell them, it's sort of a dramatic moment because it's a wedding, right? but, but I, I say to them, you were created for this moment, for right here, right now. To me, it's such a powerful, it's such powerful language that, that echoes the scripture that, that you were created for this moment because you were created for the two to become one, like at your very core and your very creation is to be in relationship. And so we could trace it all the way through the scripture. God says it's not good to be alone. And then as the people of Israel start to come into play and we start to get that story, we start to understand that the people of Israel had a hard time knowing what it meant to be in relationship with God. And so in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about this because into that comes what we call the covenants, the promises. These are relationship documents where God sits down with the people of Israel and says, this is what it's going to look like for us to be in relationship and to, to work out relationship with each other. But finally, finally, things were broken enough. God says, I, I'm not only going to have covenant with you in, in that kind of relationship, but I'm actually going to enter into your world. 
We get the story of Jesus coming into our world, the incarnation. And as Advent comes, we'll talk all about that and focus in on that. It is a, at its core, it's a story of a relationship. God, longing for relationship for, with us so much, that he sends his son into our world. And then, he fills us with his Holy Spirit. The church is filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because so we can have relationship with God. Guys, this theme of relationship stretches all the way through. Here's the last one. God does one more thing in this, in this opening chapter. He not only creates, he not only brings order, he not only enters into relationship, but then he invites us in to a mission. He gives us a job. Did you see it? He, he told them all kinds of things to do. They, 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 had, to, they had to take care of the animals. And, and we see words like have dominion. That's the old language in, in the King James Version. Here we see things like subdue and rule over. These are words of stewardship, like that we would, under God, we would take care of what God has given us. That, that we, would, we would be gardeners. In fact, in the second chapter, God's going to put Adam and Eve in the garden and say, you care for this garden. You have a job. You know, sometimes I think of work as like, oh man, that's so hard. I don't, you know, oh, the drudgery, the drudgery of work. You're like, wait a minute, Kaz, you work at a church. Is that, you know, well, there's still drudgery, right? I still have emails. I have to, you know, it's, it's not bad, really, to be honest with you, but it's pretty good. But sometimes I think about, the, oh, the drudgery of having to go to work. But did you know? And actually, we were created for it. Now, it's part of the curse that it is broken, and we find frustration in it as well. We'll talk about that next week. But there is a beauty to work. In fact, if you have no work, you find yourself without purpose. You find yourself longing and searching because you are wired. You are wired for work, for good work. You're invited into God's work, creation and bringing order. In the Old Testament, the word for bringing order is shalom. It means putting all things right the way they're supposed to be. And you are created to be people that are about the work of God, about bringing shalom to the city, about ordering relationships, about blessing the people around you. You were given this work. If we were to trace this through Scripture, we're going to see in the Old Testament how God blesses his people so that they could bless the people around him. Not only does he put them in the garden to be gardeners, but he puts them in the world to love the world, to bring order to the world, to do right in relationship. As we get to the New Testament, we're going to find uh, Paul talking to the church about how to live well together, how to do relationship together, and how to bless the community around them. And then we're going to find the great commandment and the great commission. The great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. The great commission to go into all the world and share the gospel. This is our job. Guys, uh, I'm so excited about this series. Because what we're going to see in it is who God is. As we look at God's story, we're going to see how it traces through. And as we see who God is, uh, we're going to be just blown away by the way God operates. And as we see the way God operates, we see how he operated through Scripture, but we're going to also see how he operates in us. In fact, each one of these themes is present in your life even today.